In this lecture, we'll be looking at different forms of alternative energy and renewable types that will hopefully become more prevalent in the future. The book begins with a case study in Northern Europe where an island in the Danish community uh, relinquished their past reliance on fossil fuel-based energy resources and converted to renewable energy types. And I strongly urge you to read this example and consider whether this is a sort of change that would be done readily or what cost and what scale it could be attempted. Two terms to be familiar with and distinguish between. Renewable energy are those types from sources that are replenished or are perpetually available. Think in terms of wind, sun, ocean tides, things that are readily available and are naturally uh, generated without human intervention. Conversely, there is sustainable energy, which adds the caveat that renewable energy has to have a low environmental impact in order to be sustainable. When you consider where the world currently generates its electricity and what sources it uses by the fuel type, the following chart shows that fossil fuels have been and will, are projected to be, remain the dominant source over the next few decades. Renewables are predicted to grow gradually, and nuclear uh, is predicted to stay relatively stable, owing to its very high cost and extreme environmental and human health risks associated with accidents and or terrorist acts. So the question then becomes is what are the consequences and options for using these renewable types and can we increase their percentage in our overall consumption? When you look at fairly recent sources of where the energy produced from renewables is coming from, biomass, this can be woody materials, plant materials, uh, even trash in some cases, that it's largely put into a combustion basis and is used to generate electricity through steam generation turbines. The next major component globally is hydroelectric and again this is limited to those areas that have favorable river flows and landscapes. You need fairly steep canyons and places for, where dams can be built uh, to a fairly high head in order to generate sufficient or significant electricity. In large dam operations like the Three Gorges in China, you're likely to see this percentage increase, but it is fairly limited in terms of available sites. The next segment is wind after that, and that's growing, but is still fairly small. Geothermal, natural steam produced uh, in heat underground and active solar systems um, are relatively small. Uh, the solar is more likely to grow given that it can be generated over much larger areas uh, geothermal is where you find it. Ocean systems and tidal um, power generation are, although coastlines are plentiful, given the coverage of the oceans on the earth, the number of places where you have uh, really strong tides is fairly limited. And so while this does exist on a global basis, it probably can't grow too much owing to the limited availability of, of good sites for production. Some things to bear in mind that most of these technologies have some things in common. They, the major ones involve a force uh, causing a turbine to move. A turbine you can think of as a propeller and it's driven by again a force applied either by in the case of wind moving air or in hydropower flowing water. And certain solar technologies involve uh, generation of steam through concentrated heat and that steam flowing through pipes can cause turbines to turn. A turbine will then spin the generator and the generator will produce electricity much as happens in a conventional fossil fuel fired plant. The electricity is then transmitted uh, to homes via the grid and this remains likely to be our uh, future production and transmission setup for at least the next few decades until alternative technologies Come along. Wind energy, as we noted, is the result of uh, motion of air across the Earth's surface, creating kinetic energy that can turn the, the wind turbines. The movement of air is and wind uh, results from areas of high pressure causing air to move towards areas of low pressure. 
over the face of the earth. Humans have harnessed wind power for several millennia and initially they were used probably for uh, water-based transportation and sails and later for um, other forms of mo movement but their use in milling and grinding and then pumping water uh, increased um, over the last uh, several thousand years to become increasingly um, common and you'll find that in Europe by the late 18th century there were literally thousands of windmills again for grinding and pumping water and for uh, draining the lowlands uh, in northern Europe uh, to reclaim them for agricultural use. However, with the advent of steam technology, these were steadily replaced, given the fact that wind is not constant and that steam provides, and, and sometimes a more time convenient 24-7 um, uh, availability. It is estimated that wind power is the currently the fastest growing segment of renewables. Uh, it's increased by estimated 400% over the last, probably the last two decades, and appears to be headed to maintain this growth into the future. As we noted, the flow of air past the blades of the, of the rotor causes those blades to turn. That, that turning um, is aligned along a shaft which turns a gear system of gears and reducing gears to spin the generator and then to create the flow of electricity through the generator. The book notes, and I suggest you read up on this, is that the in a form of biomimicry uh, some rather novel blade designs are scalloped along the edge uh, inspired by uh, whale humpback whale fins and this has a greater efficiency and allows them to be produce more power, especially at lower wind speeds. When you look at a residential wind system, you'll find some similarities with uh, solar electric photovoltaics. In the case of the wind system, the wind will cause the rotor to turn, spinning the generator. The electricity that's generated from or by the generator is a direct current DC system and then that's converted to AC or alternating current power which is what we use in most everyday home and residential and commercial applications. That goes through a regulator and then an inverter and the inverter technology is again something you'd commonly see in current photovoltaic systems. In some cases uh, batteries are incorporated into this for, system, for times when the wind falls below a certain speed or isn't blowing at all. This is one of the challenges of renewable energy is that it's fairly intermittent. There's two major designs, horizontal and vertical axis. In the horizontal axis turbine, as you might have seen, and because they're becoming increasingly uh, common, especially in California, you'll have the uh, shaft will spin the rotor blades in a horizontal fashion, uh, or along a horizontal axis and uh, shaft, and then that will drive the generator causing uh, based on the rotation of the um, rotor. Vertical axis designs are more novel and, and intended to try and be more productive at lower wind speeds or during more intermittent. Uh, they're not as common. I think the, either their cost effectiveness or reliability or efficiency is such that the horizontal wind axis turbine seems to be the most commonly one large wind farm deployment. In any event, their design and the selection of their design is based on construction, maintenance, and also again their performance, whether it's a higher wind area or a lower wind area. One of the key things to know and remember about wind turbines is that the their height above the ground is a key factor in determining how efficient and how uh, productive they can be. When you look at the estimated production and increase in wind power, uh, the rate of production goes up significantly with the tower height. This is due to the fact that as wind blows over a land surface, uh, typically it's rough and it causes turbulence, disrupt the flow of wind, and reduces its efficiency at spinning the rotor blades. Further above the ground, you lose this roughness and resistance effect, and 
you're able to capture more of the energy of the flowing air. Certain trade-offs occur when you get very high above the ground in terms of the type of uh, tower required, construction costs, and or um, hazards posed to, say, uh, aviation. Again, you'll see both home systems where the cost is still fairly high, but more people are willing to pay this with subsidies and low-cost loans to try and generate at their home location to diversify their electricity supply. Like solar electric systems, there's a payback period, uh, oftentimes at the five to 10 year level. And so we have to assume and hope that the operation of the uh, wind turbine will be maintained and not diminish over that time frame or have maintenance costs. Probably of greater significance at the national or international level are wind farms. These are large systems. Some can be over 500 megawatts, uh, rivaling uh, or replacing many different um, or multiple uh, coal-fired or other fossil fuel-fired plants. These can be on a terrestrial system with large towers on each, or in increasingly in offshore deployment, where there's, in many cases, excellent wind resources in offshore systems. Again, the vertical axis are much less common, but may be employed in areas with lower or more variable wind velocities as well. The wind farms are estimated to be uh, a key feature in the United States as far as its energy future. Uh, and one of the goals of the United, recent uh, goals, the United States energy policy, has to replace up to 20% of current systems um, based on fossil fuels and bring them under or have those met, needs met by wind powered turbines. The United States has an excellent wind energy potential and its capacity is quite high in terms of being able to meet more than that 20 percent over time. When you look at the United States, the areas in the dark shading on this map will find have, and these are largely in the Intermountain West, the Rockies and uh, the Utah Ranges, and then also in the northern Great Plains, but throughout the Great Plains in the central part of the state. This has to do with the regional wind patterns as air and wind mass is moving over the, the continent. It's North Dakota, South Dakota, Texas, Kansas are the states that have the highest potential for uh, wind power production. Ironically, when this chart was reporting the 2003 installed base, California although it ranks down at 15th in potential, had the highest um, installed base of any state in the country. That's changed over the last few years, and that as areas, especially in the west central states, and Texas in particular, have rapidly and significantly increased their capacity and construction and commitment to future wind farm systems, such that California will, be a, uh, will find an important contribution from wind but not as, uh, to the extent that places like the uh, interior central states can. Despite the many benefits of wind as far as its availability, lack of greenhouse gases, it still has some constraints, cost being chief among those. There are expensive systems to install, but as more wind farms are installed and the manufacturing base increases, the prices are starting to come down and they're going to become increasingly competitive with fossil fuel based plants over time. Depending on the location, there can be significant debate over the aesthetic qualities, whether you're in an individual tower based system. Uh, you can't have to be careful if you're uh, ever looking at or know someone looking at a residential installation in terms of the zoning and conflicts with neighbors because wind turbines can be loud uh, there are noise issues, and I've seen, at least in Chico, uh, one situation where a whole neighborhood, or at least a significant portion of a neighborhood, objected to a landowner erecting a large 80-foot tower on his property um, due to the fact that it sounded like a jet engine going off when it was running at, at full spin on certain wind direction days. Likewise, just the visual aspect, um, there have been a significant and harsh debate in places like off the coast of Martha's Vineyard in, in Massachusetts, where uh, a row of um, 
wind turbines on the horizon was deemed as uh, a blight on the landscape, not for its benefit, um, but not necessarily something that was aesthetically appreciated. So these debates will occur in certain locations and especially in the residential area. Um, I would advise caution for you or anybody you may know that considers that to uh, proceed carefully in the planning and coordination with, with local neighborhoods. A little more local concern that has been significant, um, at least in some cases, has been the prospect of the turbines killing or injuring birds. Um, birds are not able to detect them or are drawn through them, and so there can be bird fatalities. Overall, though, the risks and the, and the impacts of wind energy um, are small compared to many of the other problems we face with our other sources, especially the fossil fuel sources. This concludes our first section of the lecture on renewables as you continue on with part two. Next, we turn our attention to solar energy. This is one of the renewables that has probably historically in the recent past been one of the first that came to mind when you think about renewable energy. There was a fascination and an interest uh, tied to our close association with the importance of the sun in everyday life and uh, the, just the romance almost of using that for electricity inspires a lot of interest when you talk to people about that. There are several major types of solar technologies and you need to be familiar with these. They're indicated in red here. Photovoltaic cells or solar cells, these are ones that convert solar energy directly into electricity for consumption typically in the homes. Active solar is a term that's used to, more for uh, solar heating where you have some sort of a mechanical equipment component that will help capture and convert solar energy to a usable form and again most commonly for space or water heating. There's passive solar and that's a uh, system, as the name implies, where you can capture and use the solar energy inputs without having to engage uh, electronic or mechanical uh, aids or technology. And then there's a solar thermal system, which can actively capture the solar energy for heating. And we'll examine these in this lecture component. To produce electricity from solar radiation, photovoltaic cells are arrayed typically in panels covered by glass or some sort of material to protect the cells themselves. They allow for a direct conversion of the incoming electromagnetic or EM radiation in the form of light to electricity. Their efficiencies commonly at 10 to 15 percent for most commercial purchases at, uh, for the individual homes uh, vary but are steadily increase, increasing and um, improving with technological advances. You'll hear of things like thin films and uh, actually uh, photovoltaic cell coverings and coatings on materials. Solar trough collectors are another way of producing electricity but from a fairly different approach. They capture the and reflect and concentrate the heat and then use that to generate steam um, and drive a steam turbine, but it's directly using the incoming solar heat. These can be more efficient in the larger arrays, capturing up to 22 percent of the incoming sunlight, and their cost in some cases can be as low as 8 cents per kilowatt hour. Of course, this is still high relative to a lot of the fossil fuel costs when you consider that your residential power bill might be 10 or 11 cents. So the cost effectiveness is like wind is one of the issues with solar. The generation of solar electricity in a simple way is based on what's called the photoelectric effect. You have incoming light in the, in the radiant visible forms we see that strikes some form of a metal surface and the metals are designed specifically to release electrons with that kinetic energy coming in and then the electric current results from the flow of electrons from one, so one side of the circuit to another. This direct current, which is produced from solar electric cells, has to be then converted to alternating current, much like the um, wind system, and it uses an inverter 
as does the, typically the wind generated systems we saw earlier. On a typical home photovoltaic system, you'll have cells on the surface and south facing with maximum uh, sunlight exposure. These will then be uh, wired together and then feed into an inverter, which can then go back to the meter and uh, provide power into the house or uh, we'll talk about uh, back to the grid to some degree. But there's also a uh, regulator uh, if you want to use this internally, either with battery backup and the cost, um, this is a very, very small system you're showing here with this example, but um, typically uh, to run a normal family of four house can be in the neighborhood of twenty to thirty thousand dollars, depending on the number of panels and how much power you're trying to generate and what efficiency you select. Another way we mentioned to generate electricity is to capture the heat from incoming solar radiation. These are come by a variety of names. Uh, you can think of them, the name by the what how they operate. A concentrating solar collector captures neither parabolic or some sort of radially um, arrayed um, uh, system to concentrate the heat into a location, either a central receiver or a cylindrical receiver, and you'll find these as even in large um, arrays down in the Southern California desert. What they do with this heat then is to channel it into a local connector and that collector will uh, be filled with some sort of oil or water in the pipe and that will in turn be used to heat it up and generate the boiling water and generate steam that drives a conventional turbine and then allows the turbine to generate power the generator and produce uh, electricity uh, back to the grid. Some major limitations though with solar electric uh, technologies at present. They're expensive, uh, they're cost, they're, the economy of scale hasn't um, been achieved yet, uh, they're still relatively small uh, production numbers and the capacity to generate them has not increased to the point where the cost has significantly come down, although it is improving. One of the main limitations though is the fact that the power and electricity is only produced during the daytime hours. It uh, may seem intuitive and that's typically our peak use, but it's very difficult to, uh, when you think of solar electric systems, to have power that shuts off completely in production at the nighttime. And that's given our increasingly electronic and digital age with 24-7 uh, electrical use, uh, the significant switch from daytime production to nighttime zero production is a major problem. And at the local scale in an individual house, you'll need some sort of a backup energy, uh, such as battery, uh, as common. But when you think about a neighborhood or a city or a region or a state, um, traditional battery storage uh, to charge during the day to, re to level the load during the nighttime is not uh, practical. And so other technologies uh, heat storage technologies have to be investigated. And then, as you might guess, in, in coastal climates or cloudy places, um, there's simply not enough sunlight, um, or if you have significant trees or buildings, shading may be a problem. So solar technologies are of potentially great value to society, but they currently have a lot of limitations and will probably be part of a mix of sources of renewables. When you think about the production potential, and again, like we saw with the wind map, uh, some areas, as you might imagine, uh, have much greater production potential, potential than others. The map on the lower left is showing that the desert southwest is where you have the, the cloudy, excuse me, the most cloud-free days, coupled with um, the greatest uh, incoming solar radiation, and therefore the greatest ability to generate electricity. Unfortunately. Um, the greatest demand um, for air conditioning and summer use and those corresponds to the period when you have the greatest production from the panels. Uh, and again, in the western states you have very high potential and then in the picture, the, the map on the lower right, you find that these are the areas with the uh, large concentrating uh, power plants being able to uh, factor into the grid as well there. So this whole region in the desert southwest 
uh, has the potential to be a major solar electric uh, supplier in the long term. In California and several other states, um, there are financial incentives through rebates and tax incentives to offset the initial cost of purchasing the panels and the um, inverters and other tech parts of, this, of the system. Batteries are typically not included in that uh, cost investment. I think there's not a great interest in, in supplying uh, or in um, trying to get widespread battery use and taking people completely off the grid. It's difficult to do as well. Alternatively, there's what's used what's called reverse metering. Uh, and this reduces or eliminates your electric cost and it speeds the time frame over which the uh, uh, PV system will pay for itself. So if you're generating more than you're using, you are sending some electricity back out to the grid and you're getting a cost or electricity charge credit. Uh, you'll never become a net, you'll never make money or it's almost impossible to make money as a net producer because they will sell it to you for your use when you're not generating at retail rates but when they purchase it or credit you for any excess production during the day it's only at a wholesale rate. So it will pay for itself over time but it's not uh, really at the current system. The grid is limited in terms of um, how much net metering can happen um, and again especially in the context of daytime versus nighttime demand. Now we turn to the other major aspect of um, solar energy and that's for heating space and water. First off we'll look at passive solar heating it's in, t in many ways the cheapest and easiest if you have the construction uh, or capability or the reconstruction ability to capture efficiently the amount of incoming solar heat. Summer sun um, will typically you try and shade it off the windows but at lower angled sunlight during the winter winter sun enters into uh, the living space and then can heat up a floor or some sort of solar mass and then that heat can be released into the released into the living space later on. There's also a need to have good ventilation and cool airflow uh, to manage the heat loading both in the summer and maintain ventilation during the winter as well. So typically the um, key here is, is this orientation of the house and the windows um, and then some sort of uh, dark material, typically flooring. Um, I've seen other applications of uh, water tanks to where they actually heat in south facing windows during the winter and then release that heat into the living space keeping it fairly comfortable during the nighttime hours. An alternative is active solar heating and this works well in cases where you can't, uh, if you're retrofitting an existing house and don't have um, that ideal uh, ability to capture and naturally with um, natural air movement recirculate the heat through the living space. Active systems involve some sort of a pump to recirculate heated water or you can actually even have uh, recirculated air in the case of um, pumps and blowers to um, pass heated air around in different rooms and perhaps don't have uh, the direct solar face. But the system here as you might imagine has some cost to it from the standpoint of the piping of the uh, auxiliary heaters and blowers and things like that. It's probably one of the best opportunities is, is to set up a combined system uh, in that you can use uh, the solar heating for hot water pr uh, production as well as for um, heated air to warm the room and the, the house during uh, the winter months. The uh, situation is still limited to your ability to um, design or orient your house such that you have an optimum south facing exposure which is where you'll get your most of your year round especially your winter heat. Solar hot water heating in addition to space heating is very important. Um, again it follows the same rule that you need um, good so, uh, southern exposure and typically then you'll have some sort of a, a collector trap situation that will um, uh, capture the incoming solar radiation 
and uh, route water or uh, through that heated box or chamber and then the hot water can be circulated into the house for either heating or for direct hot water consumption. So the radiation comes in from the sun. Um, some radiation is uh, reflected, but some passes through, heating up the um, cooling pipe or the, the water pipes moving through the system. The heat is trapped um, and re-released from a dark mass, typically some sort of black material inside the box. The glass cover prevents heat from escaping back out and maintains optimal heating within the box to where the uh, pipes can capture the water and then circulate that into the house. Domestic systems, or hot water systems, um, are interesting because what they're doing now and becoming more cost effective is to supplement existing uh, gas or electric water heaters. Uh, they preheat the water so that rather than uh, sending a 55 degree water source, a cold water source, into a water heater on demand, you're bringing in water temperatures at or near your uh, water heater setting. So the amount of uh, heat expended by the uh, uh, water heater itself can be significantly reduced. And that can be either through um, some sort of uh, supplemental tank, um, either um, internal in the system or through some sort of larger po uh, box array, just like you'd seen in the, um, uh, in the previous slide. But again, the notion here is to uh, passively trap and then uh, heat the water and then allow it to uh, flow into the, or sometimes be, or be under pressure to move it into the water tank itself. In California, in much of the, the western states, uh, swimming pools are an excellent application for, um, and actually have been uh, widely used for solar hot water systems. Um, there are large capacity water heaters. If you have the grounds and the space, as you can see, depending on how hot you want to get it or how long you want to extend your season, um, you can significantly uh, maintain uh, more comfortable water temperatures without the cost of a water heater on your pool. And that's a significant energy savings from the standpoint of what it takes to uh, heat that much water, especially during winter months. So you can use these um, in a variety of fashions, uh, and they partially covered pools. Um, there are ways to reduce their, um, or improve their effectiveness by using um, a more efficient pump and minimize the heated temperature uh, required to keep the water comfortable. So these systems are, although uh, they're not terribly expensive, they're probably cheaper in terms of the energy costs of operating them over the lifespan of their uh, operation. Overall, uh, you should pay attention to this notion of um, the importance of water energy, hot water energy conservation. Uh, it's one of the largest, uh, after space heating, one of the largest household energy consumption areas. Uh, you can typically uh, save on your energy bill in a noticeable way by reducing uh, the water thermostat down to 120. You can wrap in an insulation, and then in cases of general water conservation, you can also use low flow water heads and faucets um, and put the water heater on a timer and only operate it during your demand period. And then more recently, there, at least in the US, um, there's increased use of tankless on-demand water heaters. So rather than maintaining a tank of water at a hot temperature, you only heat in a small chamber and quickly heat the uh, water you need real time for the application in the sink or the shower or the tub. So there are a variety of ways to conserve water. Hot water along with the implementation of solar water heating. So, and again, this is a just a quick overview of solar energy and whether you're using it for electricity or for solar hot water heaters, um, there's a tremendous uh, opportunity to um, improve the comfort of your house and reduce your costs um, as these systems pay for themselves. This concludes the second part of the lecture. You should move now to the third.
In our third section of the lecture, we'll be looking at hydropower, or hydroelectric power, in which energy is harnessed from flowing waters. The book points out that this, is, this form is, uh, provides more electricity around the world than any other renewable source. So how to square that with the earlier graphic um, stating that biomass was the largest stems from the fact that biomass in many cases is largely produced, used to produce heat um, rather than direct combustion for electricity. So as far as electrical sources, it's greater than wind by far and solar, geothermal and others. So in order to construct, excuse me, in order to produce hydroelectric power, typically it involves construction of a dam. But the question of why dams are built involves multiple different uses, not just for electricity production. Primary purposes include water supply, flood control, agricultural use of water, recreation, and of course hydroelectric power production itself, and navigation, in, typically in more humid parts of the United States and other parts of the world. Dam construction is, again, tied to its purpose as far as the type of dam it is and its primary use. A couple of the major uh, construction types are uh, earth fill materials with sand, rock, clay, um, and so on, uh, or concrete type dams. Shasta Dam in Northern California is an example of a concrete arch dam where it is one large concrete structure. Oroville Dam is an earth fill dam where the uh, solid material placed across the uh, Feather River was comprised of layered earth materials and water was routed around it until such time it was filled uh, or completed in construction and layered with materials to prevent seepage going through the dam. They can be uh, typically uh, massive gravity type structures or thin arch type. Uh, dams. Ones that are built with hydroelectric power production in mind have powerhouses uh, that contain the turbines and the generators. And a general configuration shown here that with the pool or the reservoir behind the dam, water is routed through an intake through what's called a penstock or a large um, pipe or tunnel into uh, the turbines and spinning the turbine under at high speeds generates, uh, runs the generator uh, that creates the electricity. And the water passing through the turbines then is released out into the river downstream. So the higher the dam, the greater the fall of the water from its upper surface uh, to the base of the dam, the greater its hydroelectric output. And typically dams such as Shasta or Oroville will have many of these uh, large, multi, two to three story tall turbines and generator systems in their powerhouses. Dam operations, however, are conflicted by the fact that they have to serve multiple purposes. They have to keep water at a certain level uh, for um, hydroelectric power, but with the advent of storms and unanticipated flows, uh, they don't want water topping over the system. And so in California, uh, there's a fairly delicate dance that occurs by the dam operators where they have to keep the reservoirs fairly low during the, the rainy uh, winter months so they can provide flood protection but then fill the dam as much as possible in the late spring and early summer such that they have optimal water stored for production of water supply to agriculture uh, and urban centers and then also to produce electricity during the peak demand summer months, during air conditioning season. So again, if you're trying to control for flood control, that may not be very compatible with production for water supply or irrigation. But there's a fine tuning process that occurs in order to try and meet both demands and then hydroelectric production along the way. The largest dam in the world is a title that has been rested from successive dams um, over the century or so that large dams have been constructed. The new largest dam in the world is the Three Gorges Dam in China. 
by all accounts, both on its size and its capacity, it will be the largest dam in the world when finally complete. Its primary purpose was to control uh, rather deadly flooding on the Yangtze River that has claimed uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of lives over the history of you know, Chinese civilization. Construction of the dam here, like in many places, displaces people who live into the area where the rising waters will be. And in this case, over 1.2 million people um, had to move away from their homes, sometimes ancestral homes, um, uh, leaving behind farms, cities, homes, factories, and also culturally significant sites. The final reservoir will contain water stretching back over 370 miles uh, in storage water. From a hydroelectric perspective, though, this is significant from the standpoint of meeting uh, up to 10% of China's electricity need. Concerns over safety and what would happen if the dam were to fail, however, um, could be even more catastrophic than the, fail, than the floods that occurred before the dam was constructed. So again, a conventional hydroelectric plant will convert the head of water based on its height above the generator to cause water to flow down through the penstock, spinning the turbines, turning the generator, and then creating the electrical current. There are several problems with dams, uh, but habitat destruction is uh, chief among them and that it uh, floods um, rivers and streams upstream as well as surrounding terrestrial areas and alters the flow of water and may can uh, impact, adversely impact, aquatic habitat and streamside habitat uh, downstream from the dam. So this is one of the primary problems associated with it among its many benefits. This concludes our short introduction to hydroelectric power should move on to the next section on biofuels. Next we turn our attention to one of the newer areas of renewable energy uh, focus and that's on biofuels. The book has a section on this, a significant section on uh, various projects and activities and starts with a case study looking at the relationship between the plants we use and the implications of plant type and uh, single cultures of plants versus diverse plant types in terms of their ability to produce uh, biofuels in an environmentally friendly way or and, and truly become more of a sustainable energy source. And their focus was looking on the relationship between biodiversity or the number of species present in a given area as opposed to a single species and how it relates to biofuel production. So again, I strongly encourage you to read this section uh, in the textbook on their work. One of the major things they found was that the plot, you might think that a single crop that was being harvested, and cultivated and harvested to produce biofuels might be more productive than an uh, area, area or fields with multiple species but that they found that with uh, more diverse uh, arrays of plants were much more productive than just plots with just a single species. So plant diversity, as we'll see as we talk later in the course on ecosystems, is very important to biofuel production potentially as well as to the ecosystem uh, in and around the agricultural area. This whole area has become fairly political in that in 2007, the passage of the Energy Independence and Security Act required that by the year 2022, 25% of the United States fuel uh, sources must be renewable and alternative fuel types. Uh, there are very practical reasons for this to uh, reduce our dependence on Im oil imports and foreign uh, oil resources, but also the way we get it is um, tied up in politics and, and finance and economic interests as far as where all this fuel is going to come from. Biofuels are those energy sources that are derived from living or recently living materials. This is our de definition of the term biomass. 
such as from crops or from a, a waste a crop waste typically. Almost any organic material can be processed and converted into a liquid biofuel. The most common one you'll probably have heard of is ethanol. It's on the uh, it's in mixes and gas stations commonly and been in the news from time to time. Producing biofuels uh, is oftentimes uh, being pursued nowadays through production of fuel crops. And these are crops that are not necessarily used for food or other purposes, but are being grown specifically for production of biofuel uh, feedstocks. Biofuels have several benefits. Uh, they're locally grown, and so our energy security can be improved by not being as dependent on foreign sources of oil. They're renewable, and as such, they have, uh, they're not uh, going to have necessarily the net carbon impact on the environment uh, through or the atmosphere through greenhouse gases because they're continually being turned over on a short time frame, unlike fossil fuels, uh, which are uh, which were produced long ago and are not being regenerated in a time frame that matters. Currently, they provide about 4% of our energy use, but are expected to grow substantially, up to sixfold, over the next 20 years to meet the requirements of the earlier uh, Homeland Security Act. There are two sources of biofuels, direct sources, and these are materials uh, such as wood or woody material that can be converted um, and har harvested and then um, burned directly. Um, waste biomass is another form. And then there are con constructed or processed pro wood products, um, presto logs and things like that, but also um, other materials that can be used for, uh, for combustible um, fuel sources. Our focus here is really more on the indirect sources of biofuels, things such as biodiesel, which you probably have heard more of recently, and ethanol, or bioethanol specifically, which is derived either from uh, plants grown, such as corn or starch plants, um, that are easily fermented into alcohol, and more recently, uh, less uh, agriculturally intensive crops uh, and more diversified types of plants, whether they be grasses or trees, that can be grown and uh, processed to create um, high cellulose, low sugar plants. These can provide a different form of biofuels, which we'll talk about in a moment. One of the forms of biofuels that's in the, commonly in the news these days are biodiesel types. These are fuels that are uh, directly can replace uh, diesel um, fuel, uh, can burn in diesel engines. They reduce emissions by something like 80%. And they can be processed and uh, extracted from animal fats and oils, vegetable wastes and things like that. And yes, as the slide points out, you can even you recycle the oil out of uh, McDonald's french fries vats and turn them into uh, process that into biodiesel. And it's said that you can, if you follow a vehicle um, that's burning biodiesel, you can smell the french fries. Bioethanol, which is receiving more focus because of its uh, large agricultural uh, benefit, um, is primarily an alcohol type fuel. And it's made from uh, crop, crops such as corn, uh, sugar cane, uh, but corn is the big one uh, by fermentation and distillation. So the technology to produce bioethanol and other uh, similar fuels is relatively straightforward. There are chemical processes that can be scaled up and uh, employed without uh, significant additional R&D. But this is the bioethanol directly derived from these um, corn and other starch type plants. The process for making bioethanol, uh, whether it be grain or the cellulosic, which we'll talk about shortly, um, are multiple steps. And again, they involve taking the food materials or the plant materials and running through several processes. And then there'll be energy inputs and water inputs and waste materials generated along the way before they're finally uh, 
produced into um, a form of ethanol that can be put into vehicles and sold commercially. A major alternative to corn is what, uh, and other starch type plants is what's called cellulosic ethanol. Hopefully you recall from basic biology that cellulose is a, a common plant material that is, uh, forms the cell walls and biofuel uh, is created by breaking that cellulose down into uh, the fuel type compounds. A major promising alternative to uh, corn and other starch type crops and a basis for cellulose, uh, cellulosic ethanol is algae. Uh, can generate when processed properly um, up to 30 times more oil per acre than conventional plants. However, it's a newer form, a newer technology, and our understanding ability to process it is still under the developmental phase. So in the interest of the length of this lecture, I've split the biofuels lecture into two parts. This concludes the uh, fourth lecture in the first half of the biofuels uh, section, and you should continue on in the final renewables lecture with the continuation of the biofuels topics. In this, our final section on biofuels, we'll look at bio waste and then some of the other issues associated with these and related forms of renewable energy. As we mentioned in the previous section, uh, two of the more common types of biofuels that you'll hear reference to are bioethanol and biodiesel. Biodiesel is actually an example of a bio waste in which you're deriving a benefit uh, as you convert. Uh, garbage, in this case waste material, uh, the oil, um, and cooking grease and things like that, into, into, directly into biofuel. A couple of the benefits are that you can again produce uh, energy and reduce the amount of waste that you have to process, store, or dispose of. The book has a good section on the uh, steps in the process converting waste into energy and I encourage you to study these in more detail. But suffice to say that there is a series of steps uh, to create the biodiesel itself and that during that process a certain amount of recycling can occur and byproducts, in this case uh, the process yields both biodiesel and glycerin which can, and methanol which can be recycled back into the production process and then the glycerin uh, instead of being a waste material has commercial value. And then the processing of the biodiesel involves a washing and then a transport for consumption. So again, it's a multi-step process and you have to think about our original definition of sustainable energy is that of which is relatively low impact, meaning when you account for all aspects of the processing, uh, are you creating more problems or creating additional problems by, say, changing from one fuel source to another. Two ideas we'll introduce here and come back to later in the course. One is the notion of carbon sequestration, and that involves the storage of carbon in a variety of forms in the ground or in soil, so it's not going to be directly contributing to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You can sequester carbon in plants uh, or other uh, living organisms that have below ground mass and try to accumulate that such that you aren't releasing it very rapidly back into the atmosphere. The notion of a carbon debt takes some getting used to. Uh, it's really more of a, a function of the time required for the biofuel to make up for the CO2 released in the conversion of the land from say grasslands to cornfields. Because grasslands can store and with their root systems a significant amount of carbon uh, in the plant roots but as those are converted uh, into cornfields, then the, uh, much of that stored carbon can be released uh, back into the atmosphere as well. So if you're generating biofuels uh, that have benefits, um, it takes time for that, uh, any, any benefits of that biofuel to make up for that loss of CO2 storage uh, with the conversion from, say, native grasses to um, crops such as corn. As noted earlier, the research presented at the start of this chapter talked about the fact that the 
um, high diversity plant um, operations that had multiple plants producing uh, biofuels produced more uh, fuel product and they stored because of the diversity of plant types with different uh, diverse root systems more carbon in soils as well and so there was little or no carbon debt in these plantings compared to commercial crops of corn and other um, monoculture type plants. This table in the, from the book shows a number of the advantages and disadvantages uh, and pros and cons of biofuels and you should study these and be familiar with at least examples of both. But the um, one of the major ones is the a disadvantages of certain biofuels such as corn-based ethanol may require more energy inputs than you get back from the fuel itself. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. There are also very different uh, harvest potentials of oil uh, depending on the crop type and this chart shows the some of the conventional soy or sunflower crops that we grow here in the United States and things like coconut and palms um, are, have, are grown elsewhere in more of the tropical areas whereas algae have the potential for being uh, vastly more productive overall and these can be grown um, in more of an industrial type process uh, any, virtually anywhere. Turning back to corn as a bioethanol and biofuel source uh, there are a number of environmental problems with this and unfortunately it, uh, corn is very valuable uh, from a food source and uh, to grow corn in the modern agricultural sense um, there's a considerable demand for or uh, requirement uh, for common practices to apply uh, a lot of fertilizer and pesticides to control uh, insects, uh, molds and other types. Uh, the corn is uh, high, has a high water demand to it and it displaces uh, co growing corn for fuel uh, diverts it from uh, being a food source and other f uh, and displaces growth of other food crops. Um, not mentioned here is also is that the total energy demand uh, to produce corn based ethanol is estimated to be higher than the energy you get back out. So it's even though you're gaining a domestic supply of uh, a fuel, you're losing um, a net loss of energy uh, to produce that uh, fuel source. This chart tries to capture the combined uh, effects of both greenhouse gas emissions on the horizontal axis and the total environmental impact in a percentage basis of, on, the, on the vertical axis. And here they show uh, what it takes from different places to produce uh, ethanol, biodiesel, methane, and, uh, and, uh, and then fossil fuels from the standpoint of what, what they, uh, their combustion and use uh, creates and requires. If you look at, to the right, you'll see that natural gas, diesel, and gasoline have the greatest greenhouse gas emissions among the standard fossil fuels. What you might not realize is that corn and grown in the U.S. has uh, a similar greenhouse gas emission in terms of its um, production, uh, and then we're talking bioethanol here, um, that its production has and, and consumption has the effect of um, uh, an effect equal to at least diesel um, as far as the greenhouse gas emissions and its total environmental impact is estimated to be actually higher than the standard fossil fuels when you account for loss of habitat, fertilizer, uh, application leading to water pollution, pesticide use leading to a variety of different environmental impacts, and of course the um, cost of energy, water, and other resources to grow the corn in the first place. So as a secondary type of fuel, um, its energy costs and its impact is much higher than even the uh, significant impacts associated with fossil fuels. Some of the other materials on the chart, uh, canola in the European Union, uh, soy in Brazil, um, and some of these others, rye and um, potatoes, um, are, are, that's their total impact 
um, doesn't necessarily reflect that they're being used um, that extensively, but that they're just much more costly and much more harmful to the overall environment to produce as a basis for future biofuels. So going back to the Minnesota example, um, the lesson learned there was is that nat more natural systems, meaning uh, with a higher biodiversity, it not only outperforms the monoculture in terms of the production, but it does so at a much lower, more sustainable impact. And again, these uh, grassland plantings were shown to be substantially more uh, uh, productive from the standpoint of their output and also from the um, relative impact they have on the system. And their greenhouse gas emissions are substantially lower than current biofuels from the standpoint of uh, combustion, um, biomass, uh, biomass ethanol, and biomass diesel, um, that those all have much higher impacts than the, um, than the field grassland-based plantings. Some of the other issues we face in employing renewable energy and, and and review here. Most of these technologies are new, somewhat newer and are, have been deployed on a smaller basis and so their per uh, activity cost may be actually higher. But as in the case of when you build more windmills or more solar panels uh, with, with increased production and increased industrial capacity, the prices will tend to go down and the technologies will improve. The payback time with anything new involves both the capital cost and the annual savings, um, creating the payback time to pay for the equipment. If you're um, purchasing solar panels for your house, you may do that maybe in conjunction with re-roofing. Uh, the roof may last for 25 years, the solar panels may last for 25 years, and ideally um, the solar panels would pay for themselves, say perhaps in the first um, 8 to 10 years depending on the size and the efficiency and the capacity of the array. So that payback time is important both from an individual homeowner and also from a municipality or a business um, decision to invest. Intermittency, and this is one of the primary ch technical challenges we faced, is the fact that the sun only shines a certain number of hours each day and also the wind only blows um, at select times under certain conditions. And when the wind's not blowing and the sun isn't shining, that uh, the generation of electricity, for example, has to be covered in some other fashion. And so other forms of large-scale storage are necessary to um, make renewables much more feasible in a modern grid-based system. And again, storage uh, based on batteries may work on an individual house scale, although the cost is high, their lifespan is, is not as long as the panels, say for example, or the turbine even, and then you have disposal and other environmental impacts. So large scale storage is necessary, but not necessarily based on battery. And as noted earlier, um, the, our current electricity grid is set up primarily for uh, large regional sources sending electricity out to uh, the other end of the grid as opposed to having say tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of sources sending electricity back into the grid and rerouting it. So the grid itself presents some major problems from the standpoint of being limited to the our traditional mode of uh, centralized uh, electrical generation and distribution when in fact we'll be going to with renewables, especially with solar, potentially more of a distributed source. One major renewable, essentially a renewable, is an expanded emphasis on conservation. And that in includes making choices, consumer choices, um, that use less energy, and that the, it's noted that approximately 20% of the average home electrical bill can be for simply from lighting. So how could you save uh, money and save uh, power and reduce our demand and essentially create a source of power by reduced demand? 
uh, simply switching to um, compact fluorescent bulbs is one increasingly common tack, but more importantly, just simply turn off the lights and turn off the power where you can to reduce your consumption. Uh, energy strips um, are a great way to control the, the small phantom drain that is associated with so many of our electrical appliances and uh, chargers and such. But conservation is a major, has a major role to play in taking the edge off of our, of our energy demand in the future. There are a variety of energy saving strategies, again summarized here on this table, and I encourage you to uh, study these and to be able to give some examples. So in closing, uh, the SAMSO experiment in uh, the Danish community was able to produce more energy um, the, from new renewable sources than it was using and thus became a net energy producer along the way. But this was based on changes in uh, lifestyles uh, as well as um, innovative use of both production systems, waste reduction, and um, other forms of energy efficiency. So this concludes our discussion of energy in this section, and we'll continue on with air pollution in the next lecture.